Yeah. Are we? It's recording. Okay, cool. Gavin, thank you. Okay, and you can take notes. Well, today's pretty easy. Hey, hey, you guys, we're gonna learn about momentum. Here we go. Momentum. When when we say the loss, and I'm going to do the quick version of this lesson. When when we talk about the Los Angeles Lakers having momentum, right? They've got a lot of momentum. We mean that they're hard to stop, right? They they keep scoring, and you can't stop them from scoring. They're hard to stop. All righty. So let's think about. Me, Mr. Shana, let's say I had a lot of momentum and I was coming at you. What would be true about me having a lot of momentum? Yes, Logan? Be hard to stop. Sure, I'd be hard to stop. What would be true about me? What, what attributes would I have if I was coming at you and I was hard to stop? Would I be coming at you fast or slow? Fast. Fast, right? Let me ask you something. Let's say a, a Lily were coming at you and she had a lot of momentum. Would she be harder to stop or easier to stop than me? Easier. easier. Why would she be easier? Because she's lighter. Yeah, because she has a lot less what? Mass. Yeah, a lot less mass. Okay? So if Lily wanted to have as much momentum as me, if, we, if she wanted to be as hard to stop as I am, well, I've got way more mass, so what's she going to have to have way more of? Speed or velocity, correct? And so this idea of momentum is our way of combining these two seemingly unrelated quantities, mass and velocity. So let's go ahead and write this down. Momentum equals mass times velocity. Okay. If you prefer, oops, equals, if you prefer to do it as letters, m times v, where v is a vector. We'd like to use a letter for m, but we can't use, a letter for momentum rather, but we can't use m because mass is m and meters is m and mega, the prefix, and milli, the prefix, are m's. So we can't use m, so we're going to use another letter. We'll use a letter close to m. It'll be P. <laughs> so the small letter P is momentum. It's what we use for momentum. And I want you to notice, because of the velocity is a vector, that makes momentum a vector, which means you can have positive and negative momentum. Here, let me give you a quick question. Example number one, a five kilogram mass is going 15 meters per second to the right. I'd like everyone to please get me what is the momentum of this mass? Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. Hopefully everyone got 75. Tell me, what's the units of momentum? Meters per second. Yeah, kilogram meters per second, right? Just what you see there. Kilogram meters per second. Now unfortunately, we have not found, we haven't found any dead white guys to name the units of momentum after, Unfortunately. although there are many dead white guys, for some reason we've never chosen any of them. So we're stuck with just kilogram meters per second, that's it. Let me ask you this question. What if I told you that the five kilogram mass was going 15 meters per second to the left, then what would the momentum be? Yeah, thank you, Imani. It'd be negative. 
because momentum is a vector, just like velocity and force. So momentum in that direction is positive. Momentum in that direction is negative. Momentum in that direction is positive. Momentum in that direction is negative. It's a vector, so we'd have negative 75 kilogram meters per second. Alrighty. <coughs> well, hey, that's momentum. Now I'm going to teach you about another quantity. Thanks, Kevin. The quantity called impulse. And with impulse, we're going to define two more seemingly unrelated quantities. Those quantities, force and time. So impulse is equal to force times the, if you, you know, if you prefer, the elapsed time. <coughs> that is force times the time over which you're exerting that force. And force is a vector. And elapsed time, I'm going to call it delta t, because it's not like just a point in time. It's actually a, an amount of time that's elapsed. So it's delta t. And impulse, we like to name impulse by a letter. We can't use i, because i is what we use for rotational inertia, and i is what we also use for current. So I'm going to be like our textbook. And for short, we're going to call impulse, impulse. There is no letter. Now, some books use capital J for impulse, which makes no sense to me at all. So our textbook uses the word impulse. They never have a short shortening for it. So that's just going to be impulse. So hey, let's do example number three. I exert 80 newtons of force for three seconds, whoops, find the impulse. Please do that now. Now, you know, of course, the important thing I'm getting you to do is not so much multiplying the numbers, but getting the units. That's really what this is all about. You guys okay that you've got 80 newtons times 3 seconds? And that's going to get you 240. And what's the units? Newton seconds. Yeah, newtons seconds. Newtons times seconds. So now the next question is, is there a relationship between momentum and impulse? I mean, why is Mr. Shana teaching them both on the same day? Mr. Shana meaning me, who would like to tell me, what's your first clue that there might be an actual relationship between impulse and momentum? What? The units. The units? What, what, what do you mean? What about the units? Well, the first one is uh, kilograms per meters per second, while the other one is, isn't um, newtons kilograms per meters per second squared? Yeah, and we don't say kilograms per meter, we just say kilogram meters per second, whoops. Per second squared, yeah. And then they cancel out, and then they just like. Thank you. You guys okay? They have the same units. Right? I'm thinking, wait, they might be related to each other because they have the same darn units, kilogram meters per second. It's just, you know, impulse, we use newton seconds, and, and uh, momentum, we use kilogram meters per second, but, but they're the same units. Well, let's see if there's another relationship, another way I can find a relationship. Let's start with Newton's second law of motion, my favorite equation in the entire universe. If someone were to actually come to me on the street and ask me, what is your favorite equation? I would say F equals MA. I would not say X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A. No, I wouldn't say that. No, sorry. How many of you would say that? Yeah, see, well, you're different from me then. Okay. So I got force equals ma, but you know acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. And now I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by change in time. And I got force times the change in time equals mass times the change in velocity. Tell me, what's the left side of this equation? You guys think an impulse? Good. And tell me, what's the right side of the equation? Is anyone thinking momentum? Except for one thing. It's not m of v. Do you notice the right side is m delta v? 
mass times the change in velocity. So it's not really in, uh, momentum. Here, let's go ahead and work this out. Change in velocity is the final velocity minus the initial velocity. And so I've got mass times the final velocity minus mass times the initial velocity, which means mass times final velocity, well, that would be my final momentum. And mass times initial velocity would be my initial momentum. So really, impulse isn't equal to momentum. What's impulse equal to? Yeah, change in momentum. Impulse is equal to the change in momentum. And that is to say, if I want to change the momentum of a system, I'm going to have to exert an impulse on it. And the impulse will be equal to the change in momentum of the system. Let me write that down. That's, that actually has a name. It's called the impulse momentum theorem. Just a second. Impulse momentum theorem. The impulse momentum theorem very simply is an equation. It says that impulse equals change in momentum. Or if you want to place, say it a different way, to change the momentum of a system requires an impulse. a force exerted over a time. <coughs> Let me show you what I'm talking about. Impulse equals change in momentum. I need someone to come up here who feels comfortable catching a 2.2 pound mass that we throw to each other. Anyone feel comfortable catching? Anyone? Okay, come on up, Sean. Wait, come <laughs> on, oh, Sean. Oh my God. Paul, come on up, Paul. I don't know why I doubt of you as Sean. I mean, Sean's there, but I mean, I, I, I was thinking of you like an, an Asian John, Sean. Pacific <laughs> Islander Sean or something. OK, great. You ready? Now, I'm going to throw it such that it's kind of rolling like this. So, Because if I throw it like that, it would be really hard to catch. So I'm going to throw it like that so you don't hurt yourself. But I want you to catch it in such a way that you do not hurt yourself, even to the point of exaggeration. I need you to catch it in such a way that you won't hurt yourself. Please watch as Paul catches this. You ready? And use both hands, please. Oh, there. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. <laughs> Tell me, what should what should Paul do if he does not want to hurt himself? Yeah, here, throw it to me. <laughs> you guys okay with that? You see how I caught it? Okay. Consider force times change in time equals change in momentum. Uh, uh, Paul and I are pretty much throwing it at the same speed, which means. This mass is experiencing the same change in momentum, whatever momentum we imparted to it, you know, to zero. So the change in momentum is whatever momentum we imparted to it. But when I caught it the way I showed, right? In fact, go ahead and do that. And I'd like you to exaggerate it. Don't just catch it like that. Here, watch. watch. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean? Thank you very much. So what he's doing is greatly increasing the change in time. Change in momentum is the same. Right, because he and I are throwing it at about the same speed, same momentum. So what's happening to the force that he acts to exert? Yeah, it's going to be teeny tiny, right? Whereas here, uh, throw, don't throw it as hard, but throw it to me. Watch my hand. Ow. Did you hear that? Yeah. that? That actually hurt a little. You know what I mean? Because how much time did I allow for me to stop it? No, no time at all. Right? I caught it kind of the way he caught it the first time. You see, when, when he threw it to me just then, I minimized the amount of time, which means I maximized the amount of force. Same change in momentum, but I want you to see that there's a relationship between force and time. If you can maximize the time, you minimize the force. Minimize the time, you're going to maximize the force. 
Hey, thank you very much, Paul. Give Paul a big hand. Yay. So, so let me give you an example. Suppose I'm in a fight and my opponent throws a punch and now I have a fist and an arm coming towards my face with a particular momentum and my face is going to change the momentum of that fist plus arm to zero, right? <laughs> By exerting a force on that fist and arm. So tell me, what am I going to have to do with my face in order to minimize the amount of force? Yeah, move it in which direction? Yeah, move it backwards. Move it away from the punch. You see what I mean? There's a name for that. It's called rolling with the punches. Okay? By moving away from the punch, sure, you're stopping their fist plus arm, but you're maximizing the time and minimizing the force. One, one boxer that I, I see, I've seen who's actually amazing at that, you know, bobbing and weaving is what it's called. You know, one boxer who was amazing at that was Mike Tyson. When Mike Tyson was early in his career, people would hit him and exert no force on him whatsoever because he had this almost supernatural ability to roll with a punch, you know? So they'd go boom and nothing, you know? Yeah. So yeah, if you roll with the punch, you won't be hurt. Whereas if you don't roll with the punch, I, I remember reading a student, you know, newspaper story about some like welterweight boxer. So he's a guy who's like 110, 120 pound boxer. And he was on the road and some big trucker cut him off. And then the big trucker did this road ragey thing and they, they pulled over and, and the trucker went striding to the car and, and the boxer got out of the car and the trucker said, you know, started intimidating him. And the boxer went boom and, and the trucker mm -hmm. Of course, he's not a trained boxer, so he didn't move his big stupid head. And the little boxer went boom, and the guy went down like a sack of potatoes. And the boxer goes, "Uh oh, I, I just killed him. I just killed the guy." Well, he wasn't killed, but but it just shows to show you don't need to be that powerful if the guy you're hitting doesn't know enough to move away from your punch. You know, that's why when you hit someone when they're unawares, they end up sustaining a lot more damage because they don't get the chance to move away from the punch. Hey, uh, let me give you another example. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's a wall, and I'm going to jump off the wall. Tell me, how should I land to minimize the amount of force being exerted on my body? Yeah, absolutely. You, you bend your knees, right? You, you bend your knees, and what are you, what are you maximizing? What? He's bending his knees. What? <laughs> there we go. Well, anyway, he, he's minimizing the force, right? Let me ask you another question. Um, does, does anyone in this class, has anyone in this class ever done what's called cliff jumping or cliff diving? You have Logan? Okay, well, let me ask you this, Logan. When you jump from the cliff, how are you supposed to land in the water? Uh, nicely. <laughs> what does that mean? Be specific. Oh, um, you're supposed to land like feet first. Good, land feet first, completely perpendicular to the water. In fact, what do you do with your feet? You point them towards the water. Because I'll tell you what, you want water drag you know, you want water drag to slow you down. You want to hit the water and knife into the water so you go really <laughs> deep so that, what? So, so, so you can, you know, so that water drag slows you down. What if you decide, you know what, I, I'm not patient. I, I don't want to go deep. I would rather stop really, what's wrong? Okay. Well, um, so what if you decide I'm going to land like this? Ooh, yeah. uh, now, now what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah you, you might very well die, right? Because now water drag isn't slowing you down. Surface tension is slowing you down. And surface tension will slow you down real fast. It's like hitting concrete. And so the time will be very small, which means the force will be incredibly high and you'll be seriously injured. Like Logan, have you ever been actually hurt uh, doing the cliff jumping? So you've been able to get through that. Yeah. Has anyone in this class ever cliff jumped? Okay. Usually I get one or two students and yeah, and if you if you land just a little off, if your body precesses just a little bit, then you're gonna experience some real pain. 
you know? Unless you don't jump off. I mean, it's like me, my idea of cliff jumping would be like, oh, I'll just jump from right there. You know? <laughs> I, I can do that, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Okay, well, hey, let me give you, yes, Alex. But eventually, if you go high enough, even the water drag wouldn't be enough? Right, eventually, you're, you're just going to be hurt no matter what. And also, the problem is, if you go high enough, now, if you make any mistakes at all, it could kill you. So there comes a point where, where the risk of going too high is huge. Yeah, you might, you, I mean, if you, if you enter the water properly, you'll be fine. But if you go too high, you enter the water improperly, and, and now you're dead. <laughs> so that's why there's a limit. Like I don't know, like isn't it like 50 feet or something? How how high were you? Uh, I only did like 30. Feet. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, don't talk to me about that. I would I do like eight. <laughs> I could I could handle eight feet, maybe six. You know? Yeah. Dangerous to go ahead first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be really dangerous to go ahead first. Yeah, no, you don't do that. Yeah. Well, okay. So if you do this sort of thing and you're absolutely perfect, you'll be fine. If you do any mistakes whatsoever, now you like you're dead. You die. Yeah, yeah, you just jump. I mean, the joy of it is just free falling for feet. So you just like like a little, you just have to the, the pencil. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I mean, like I said, the joy isn't hitting the water. The joy is falling for 50 feet. I mean, that's, you don't ordinarily fall 50 feet and survive, but here you get to do that. I don't know. Don't ask me on these sides. I'd rather stay at home, lie on my bed, and read a book. You know? That's my thing. Okay. <coughs> Here, let, let me have you do a numerical problem, but I'm going to talk a little bit more conceptually. Okay. Here, here's my numerical problem. A 1,000 kilogram car going 25 meters per second comes to a halt in five seconds. <laughs> Okay, and this car is going to the right. Okay, this car is going that way. All right, 25 <laughs> meters per second to the right, so it's a positive velocity. Right is positive. I'd like you to find me the following things. What's the initial momentum? What's the final momentum? What's the change in momentum? And then use impulse equals change in momentum to find the force exerted on the car. And we're assuming a constant force. It's the average force exerted on the car, but I'm going to assume a constant force. Good luck.
okay. How many people are done? Oh, almost nobody. Okay, hurry up. <laughs> Force times change in time equals change in momentum. Hopefully everyone got a change in momentum of negative 25,000 kilogram meters per second. It's negative because you had a momentum, positive momentum, then you lost it. And so now let's go ahead and use impulse. Impulse equals change in momentum. So I got force times, how many seconds is it? Five seconds? Equals negative 25,000 kilogram meters per second. And you'll notice when I divide by seconds, that makes the right side kilogram meters per second squared, which is newtons. And I get a force equals negative 5,000 newtons. Did anyone, how many people got that answer? Okay, good, that's easy. That's, that's about the level of difficulty of tonight's homework. It's really pretty simple. Let me ask you this question. Why is the force negative? Was that Noel? Could you slow down? Tell me more. What direction must that force be pointing? To the left. Yeah, to the left. Correct. My car is going to the right, and the right is positive direction. Then that force must be being acting to the left to slow it down. It could be the brakes, your, you know, the friction between the wheels and the road are exerting a force that way to slow you down. Maybe Spider-Man is in front of the car and he's exerting a force that way, or maybe you've got a, a parachute that deploys. But regardless, the force has to be in the negative direction if it's going to result in a change in momentum that's negative. Okay. Any question or problem on that? Okay. Then let me give you another example. Another one of these type examples. So I had a friend, have a friend, his name is Ron, he was my friend in college, and Ron lived on the second floor of a dorm. And the second floor dorm rooms had balconies, patio places where you could go outside your dorm and sit there in the open air and enjoy the evening. And so my friend was totally drunk, and so he decided to walk along the balcony. And then you know what happens next. He was totally drunk, so what do you suppose happened next? He fell off. He fell off, absolutely. So he fell off, splat. <laughs> and you know what happened to him? He sprained his thumb. And that was it. Now, why, why did he not get hurt, even though he fell off a second story balcony? Did he bend his knees? <laughs> What's that? Did he bend his knees? Nah, I don't know how he fell. But tell me, what is it about being drunk? How was he when he hit the ground? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, he was relaxed, I'm drunk, yeah. he, he, may, he may not even been aware that he was falling, who knows, you know? But yeah, he's totally relaxed. That's why drunk people can fall down a flight of stairs and be okay, right? Because they're all drunk, every blow that happens to them is maximum time, you know? And minimum force. You guys okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, don't be drunk, but, but if you're gonna fall down a flight of stairs, at least yeah. relax or something? I don't know. <laughs> you know? Is that true? In football, do they say, like, when you're about to be sacked, are you supposed to tense up or are you supposed to relax if you know you're going to be tackled? Um, they don't really say anything. They don't say anything about that? Yeah, because... See, because I don't know what works in football, because there's other issues. There's a guy who's actually doing it to you, so, so it may benefit you to actually exert a force to counter them, I don't know, but rather than just being a rag doll. You know? <laughs> but uh, all things being equal, if you can be a rag doll, you'll, you'll uh, sustain less injury. But you hate to be that rag doll where the guy picks you up and body slams you on your throwing shoulder like what happened to Jim McMahon, an old quarterback, and that pretty much ended his career. Okay, all right, well, hey, uh, we learned about momentum. What's momentum equal to? Yeah, mass times velocity. What's uh, impulse equal to? Good. And the impulse momentum theorem says impulse is equal to what? 
change in momentum. Yeah, not momentum, change in momentum. Yeah. All right, good luck. Thanks a lot, Gavin. Right, press the button. Yeah, press that button.